This video is for paper two time zone one practice test, the one we did during e-learning week, um, and go over some different problems that uh, some of you are having troubles with. You graded your own, you saw the answers, doesn't mean that uh, you understand yet, so I wanna make sure you're ready to get off of that struggle bus. So the first one I'm gonna look at, I'm not gonna look at every single problem, but I know there were some general questions people have uh, with a cumulative frequency graph what you have to remember is that there is symmetry on the y-axis and the x-axis is a result of drawing symmetry lines over from the y-axis so in general you find out how many how many there are so in this case there's 120 um, vehicles and so you can draw lines over, so if you want to find the median, you draw a line over and down, use a straight edge, of course, and then the median of the top half and the median of the bottom half. You can actually make a box and whisker graph from the cumulative frequency graph using those values. And so you notice there's not symmetry down here, even though there's even symmetry there. So most of you can answer the questions on that first side but for here just want to make sure that you're able to read this form and how you use the cumulative frequency graph to help you so these are frequencies the number of vehicles and to get a cumulative frequency graph you always add the frequency to the existing cumulative frequency so at, at zero from 0 to 10, we have no vehicles. And then when we go to 20, there are four vehicles for a cumulative frequency at 20, which means the regular frequency had to be 4. And then you go, I'm trying to make that mark on there, and you go to 30, and there are 20 vehicles, because 4 plus 16 is 20. So 0 plus 4 is 4. 4 plus 16 is 20, 20 plus 64 is 84, 84 plus 26 is 110, and we know we end up with 120 because it says there's 120, so that's how this last one is 10. So it's important that you keep track of if they're giving you cumulative frequency or frequency, in this case they're giving you frequency and you've and you got to use the cumulative frequency to, go, to work backwards from there. So I think if you get that, the rest of the problem is okay. If you're putting this in your calculator, like it says later on in, in G, you want to put list one be the midpoints, and list two would be your frequencies for, for this table that you found. And then you do one variable stats with list one comma list two. Don't do it with the cumulative frequencies or you'll end up with a whole bunch more values. Next problem, this is number, we're gonna go to number three on this worksheet. Or number four, I mean. Uh, and notice I skipped the first part of this problem because most of you figured out the basic trig stuff, but I'm gonna write the results in, um, Angle ACB was 30, and since those add up to 140, that leaves you with 40 here, and this side was like 1,315, 6, 5, 3, something or other. Lots more decimal places. Um, but I wanted to jump to this one because it said, calculate the area that must be kept clear of boats. Okay, if there's a non-right triangle, any triangle, but they're, they're gonna, you're not going to find the area of a triangle very often when you're doing a trig problem by doing one-half base times height. You're going to use that area formula that's on your formula sheet, the side angle side one. So one-half times 700 times 900 times the sine of 110. And so that number ends up being really big. Some of you are wondering where that came from. You can do one half base times height, but you didn't have to draw in an altitude. We don't really have the height. The height's got to be at a right angle. 
and then a lot of people are struggling with this, determine giving a reason whether the course complies with the safety regulations. The safety regulations are that the distance from B to AC must be greater than 375, the shortest distance. So the shortest distance from B to AC is right here. So you need to find that distance. Well, you have a little right triangle right here where you know this is 700 and we got this is 40. You can find that distance uh, using sign. And if it's more than 375, they're in compliance. If it's less, then they're not in compliance. Okay, so those people, or those ones people were having a little trouble with in class, so I thought I'd give you an explanation in case you need to watch it again. Later on in this problem, calculate, now we have a helicopter hanging out over uh, directly above point A. And so, I mean, you can't really draw 3D on here, but what you do know is there's going to be a triangle and if this is A and this is B at a right angle above is this helicopter so we know there's a right angle right there and we don't know how high it is above A it's telling you to find that height but we do know if you label your picture here we know this is 700 and it says the angle of elevation from B is 15. So this is 15. So if you want to redraw it so it is an easy right triangle, that's 15, that's 700, and that's H. And you can find that using tangent. And it gives you the height of the helicopter, which is ends up being like 188-ish when you do that. And then it says calculate the maximum possible distance from the helicopter to the boat on the course. So if we go back over here again, this helicopter is up here. We already found the distance above here. You could find this distance. That's not the, that's not the maximum distance. The maximum distance is going to happen when you take the helicopter all the way over to C. Well, we have, still have a right triangle, and we know the height of the helicopter to be 188 or 187 and we know this distance is 1316 or 1320 whatever you used for your value there so that longest distance would just be a plain old Pythagorean theorem problem and that was tricky on this problem if you notice uh, 11 of the points for this question were in those last few parts there Okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so we're on the calculus part here. Um, Remember, we're just looking to find the derivative. Make sure you rewrite stuff um, before you try to do anything. Get rid of all the the variables in the denominator. So rewrite this. And remember, if you get stuck, this k is throwing you off. What would you do if that was just a plain old number? Okay. So first step is to find the derivative. That's generally where they go with this. So this is negative. 192 x to the negative 3 plus k because if that was 7x the derivative would just be 7 that that's an important thing to note there just writing it down that's three points for that derivative it says the graph has a local minimum point at x equals 4 local minimum just means that the slope is of the tangent line is 0 so we just found, this is where your definition again comes in. We just found the slope of the tangent line. We know that it's 0 when x is 4. And they're just saying verify what you get for k. So if I do this, we have 194. 4 to the negative 3 is 1 over 4 to the 3rd, or 164th 
plus k, and you can finish it from there, but that's going to be negative 3, and when you add to the other side, you get 3. If you can't do that, you just scratch it out, and you go on. You say, I know k is 3. So if I know k is 3, I have my original function now, and I have my derivative where k is 3. So I have, that's a 3, and I could change this one to 96 x to the negative 2 plus 3x. A weird pen. So they're having us find f of 2. f of 2 just means I'm plugging in f of x. So 96 2 to the negative 2 plus 3 times 2. f of 2 is the same as y. They are giving me the point so that I can eventually find a tangent line, I'm guessing. So when you plug that in and simplify it, you get 30. So I have the point 230. To find the equation of any line, I need to know a point, and I need to know the slope. So I'm going to take and plug in 2 to my derivative so I can find the slope. So that's 192, 2 to the negative 3, plus 3. And I did that earlier, and you get negative 21. So I have the slope and a point. They're not asking me for a tangent line yet. They're going to either ask me for a tangent or a normal. So to finish this problem, I'm just going to help you read it a little bit. Equation of the normal to the graph. I just found the information I needed for the tangent. The only difference is for the equation of the normal, I'm going to use the opposite reciprocal slope. So 121st, that's the opposite reciprocal. I'm going to start like that, and I'm going to plug in my point, 230, and solve for b. And then they have you sketch a graph. Um, set your window exactly as it is here and put in this equation and and make sure you have your maxes and mins and intercepts labeled uh, several of you when I looked didn't have that correct okay the last one state the values for which f of x is decreasing we haven't had time to talk about that very much but basically if the graphs going down the, the, that you made here, it's decreasing. So you're talking about like listing intervals and that sort of thing there. Okay. Let's go to the next step. Last one here. We just did this right before calculus, but I want to make sure that you remember the highlights. Uh, a cup of boiling water is placed in the room. So we have this, this nasty equation right here with you can't put it in your calculator. You always said put it in your calculator. We can't say we're just going to put it in our calculator. Um, so we know a couple things. It says a cup of boiling water. We know the temperature of the room is, is 20. And they have this model. T is the temperature of the water. Minutes with the cup is in place. Blah, blah, blah. It says explain why A equals 20. Well, eventually the cup cools down to room temperature and a is always the asymptote sometimes it ends up before sometimes it ends up after sometimes you see it like this but I know that's equal to 20 if you can't explain it you skip it and you put it in for 20 you know that it's equal to 20 they just told you that now they're going to give you some more values at m equals zero the water temperature is 100 so the temperature is 100 when n equals 0, k to the 0 is 1, not 0. So now I have b equals 80. So I have a new equation that's better than the last one because it doesn't have many variables. It's t equals 80 times k to the negative m plus 20. It's gotten a little better.
they have to give us more information if we're going to be able to plug in and get rid of this stuff so we can graph or use our calculator. After being placed in the room for one minute, the temperature is 84. Show that K equals 1.25. This is a point to plug in. Temperature is 84. K to the negative 1 plus 20. So you can solve by graphing. You can do lots of different stuff here. I'm just going to do a little algebra. I'm going to bust open a can of algebra. 64, 80, K to the negative 1, yada, yada, yada. Divide here and then take the reciprocal and you get 1.25. And then we get to using the calculator part later on. All right, we're going to keep going. This video is getting too long. A couple things to note that you may have forgotten. Your TVM solver underneath the apps, finance, sometimes it's called TVM, finance. The thing I'm concerned about is this right here, this number of investment periods. It's the years times the compounding. So you always want to look for compounding. This is compounding monthly. That's 12. That shows up here and here, but it also shows up here, the years times the compoundings. Everything else is, I think you'll be pretty good on. Remember to have one of them be negative and you have to do alpha solve to get to the next one. So you might want to just try putting this one in, making sure you, uh, you get these numbers to show up. When you put them in your calculator, you should get 18544.55. Five, so test that out. Make sure you know what you're doing. Okay, let's keep going. The other thing is uh, distributions. This is all um, under second VARs, which says distributions. Normal CDF. Some calculators, it, it asks you lower and upper mean standard deviation. Some of you have to list lower, upper, mean standard deviation. So this would be for this picture here. Mean is 70. Standard deviation is 4.5. They're asking you for the probability that someone would have a 75 or more. So 75 to a really big number. You can do bigger number than that, but that should be good. So you, if you know the interval, you're using normal CDF. If you know the probability, so this would be the probability that we're finding right here. So 90% of this data would be 75.5. Seven six, whatever that number is, or less. So you enter the probability, the mean, and the standard deviation. So these two kind of are connected back and forth. They're not the exact same problem, but if you know the probability you're using inverse norm, some of your calculators will ask you left and right, um, right tail and left tail, but in general, this is always going to give you the value to the left. So you might have to subtract it from one to get the overall value. And then the last thing on here, uh, after we reset your calculators, you need to change the mode to degrees and you need to go to catalog and turn on your diagnostics to make sure that they are set so you can find the R value when you do linear regression.